is a nail that was used by the Romans for construction about 2,000 years ago from a castle in Scotland in a tar pit. The base of the castle, they found a bag of nails and this is one of them. And the castle was built around the time of Christ. So the nail I'm going to show you is possibly the type of nail that was used to fasten criminals on the cross in the first century. Now the nail would look like this. And if you examine it closely, you can see that this is homemade. The top of it, because it's so old, has uh, been uh, rusted and it's much, much smaller. But you know, the Bible said that not a bone of him would be broken. And if you think about it, the nail would have to be something like this. And you can push through the wrist right here, how that you could actually take a nail and push it through and spread the lim uh, ligaments of the hand without breaking a bone. And so there they would nail the criminals to the cross, the hands and the feet. There were four Roman soldiers, one to hold the feet, one to hold the right hand, one to hold the left hand, and one to hammer the nails. And then they would hold the criminals down as they would fight and spit and curse God, and they would nail them to the cross. But when it came to the Lord Jesus, these soldiers knew it was much, much different when they nailed him there. He was giving his life. He says, no man takes my life from me. I give it up of my own accord. He was willing to die for you and for me. And so he would, as it were, lay down. And with the terrible anguish of the nails going through his hand and through his feet, I'm sure he would scream out and wince. And yet the Bible says he kept on saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Once a criminal was attached to the cross, they would take and they would lift him up and they would drop the cross down into a socket in the earth so that when it would drop down, all the weight of gravity, the weight of the body would come down and the, the nails and the hands would be there and they would have to bear that weight and then the feet and their legs would be bent so that they could pull their body up and they could fill their lungs with air and they could breathe. And that's how they would do it. They'd pull their body up and the way they would struggle and breathe to take breaths would be to uh, lift and to fill their cavity of their, their lungs up and then they would let it back down. And they would pull again and lift it up. And there is where the scripture says, He kept on saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And here the very energy of the Lord Jesus was going out in love for the very ones who crucified Him. Well, tradition tells us that the women of the city hated the horrible, horrible crucifixion and the screaming out of the criminals as they died. And so they developed a concoction that was used as a pain reliever. It would be myrrh and gall. And they would take and they would put it up on a sponge. And they would take it and they would offer it to the criminal as he was dying on the cross and he would be able to have a pain reliever. So it would relax his body, similar to what we use today when we use morphine to kill pain. And so they would get that into the vinegar and gall, and they would put it to his mouth, and the criminals would take it in, they'd say, more, more, and they would take it in, take it in, to get that pain to relieve, and finally their body would just drop limp, and they wouldn't have the pain. But when they brought that to the mouth of the Lord Jesus, they said he would not take it. He wouldn't take anything that would take away the pain. He would go through with full consciousness all of the pain that he would have to suffer in order to pay for the sins of mankind. And so as he hung there on that cross, he was there for six hours. From the third hour, which would be 9 a.m., until noon would be three, the first three hours. From noon till three in the afternoon would be the second three hours. Now for the first three hours when the Lord was there, the men walked by and they said, Oh, thou that uh, destroys the temple and builds it again in three days, save yourself. Oh, he saved others. He could not save himself. If you're the Christ, come off the cross. And they mocked him, even as he hung there, in pain and anguish, dying on that cross. And then, at 12 noon, in the middle of the day, when the sun was in the middle of the sky, 
the earth became enveloped in darkness. And for three hours, the Lord Jesus would become the sin bearer. He spoke in Gethsemane of a cup, of a terrible, terrible cup, where he would have to take the very wrath of God, the very angry judgment of God against the sin of mankind. And so, from, for those three hours, God would take all of our sins and He would punish His Son for them. Only would the Lord Jesus have the capacity to bear that kind of wrath from a holy God. The Lamb of God that came from heaven would come and have to die for sinful man. And Peter would say, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement for our peace was upon Him and with His stripes we are healed. And Israel one day will recognize their Messiah as the one who is wounded for them and died for them. The Bible says also in Isaiah, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Him that He would put Him to grief. When He would offer Himself, He would become a sin offering. And so it was as if God Himself would take the cup of all the iniquity and sin of all of mankind and He would press it to the lips of His dear Son and cause Him to have to drink down all to the last very drop and pay for our sin. All the physical suffering was nothing compared to the death that He died for you and me there. In Hebrews it says, He tasted death for every man. And so, the Apostle Paul would say, the one who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might have the righteousness of God in Him. And so the Lord Jesus became the very target of God's wrath. And all of it was poured out. The Lord God would have to be completely satisfied with the judgment of Calvary that every sin was paid for from the first man to the last, every sin. And so after those three dark hours when he bore the judgment of the world upon himself, the Lord Jesus would take, and they would take another sponge and they would dip it in sour wine and stick it to his mouth after he said he thirst, and he would say, Finished! Finished! It's done! And what he meant was that he paid for all sin. Every bit of it was paid for. Many, many people think that they're going to pay for their own sins. Well, they're 2,000 years too late. Man's righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. And to go about and establish our own righteousness is foolishness. Because God's Son paid for every sin. It's done. It's paid for. And there the Bible says that he gave up the ghost. He yielded his spirit. He commanded his spirit to leave his body. Well, as he was hanging on the cross, because it was preparation for the Passover, they asked Pilate if they could remove the body. Now, Pilate was very surprised. Sometimes people would actually linger on a cross for, for days and days, and yet, within this one day, Jesus would die. And so the soldiers were commissioned to go out and to break the legs of the criminals. And so what would happen you could grab that from me, is that as the, the criminal was attached to the cross and he would be pulling himself up to fill the cavity of his lungs with air, they would come along with their spears and they would take the butt end of the spear and they would smack it across the legs breaking many bones in the legs. Now when those bones were broken, their body would fall limp and they would actually suffocate and drown in their body fluids as they filled their lungs and that's how many, many criminals would die. 